Hey church, and welcome to this week's small group. Now we're going to start out this small group with two questions that I want you to contemplate. Who are the most important three people at the Pulse? And you're not allowed to say Jesus, Holy Spirit, or the Father, or God, or any of those. So who are the most important three physical people at the Pulse of Miami Church? And if you had to rank yourself on a list of importance at your church, where would you be on that list? All right, so those were trick questions. Uh, there is nobody more important than anyone else at the church. You know, there's Jesus, he's the head, and then all of us are on the same playing field. And, you know, some people might think, well, you know, but, you know, if we didn't have a pastor, then we, we would be out of luck. But here's what I believe, that if I wasn't the pastor of the Pulse of Miami Church, that God would supply another person to be the pastor. And if Carmen wasn't the children's director, that God would supply another person to be a children's director. But don't tell her I said that, because I always tell her that she's irreplaceable. So make sure Carmen doesn't see this video. You are just as important as me. You're just as important as Carmen, as Steve, as Raul. Notice how I didn't say Wesley. So you're just as important as anybody else, even Wesley. So the overall theme of this small group is going to be asking the question, what are the benefits of baptism? And what I want you to notice is that we're going to be reading some scriptures today that most people don't use these scriptures to teach about baptism, but I think these are the perfect scriptures to understand the importance of baptism. I want to start out by saying that John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but he, meaning Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's two different kinds of baptism. There's a water baptism, and then there's a baptism by the Holy Spirit. What, what I want you to do is read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. And I want to ask you the question, what is the unifying factor of all believers? And what kind of baptism is this passage referring to? Is it water baptism or spiritual baptism? So the unifying factor for all believers is the fact that we have all been baptized by the same Holy Spirit. There's, there's nobody who's beyond that. There's nobody who didn't need that kind of baptism. And so whatever background we come from, we all need the Holy Spirit to baptize us. And this refers to spiritual baptism, not necessarily water baptism. But what I want you to notice is that when the apostles wrote about baptism, they didn't necessarily separate out spiritual baptism from water baptism as far as we do. You know, when somebody accepted Christ in, in the times of, of the New Testament, man, they were baptized in water right away. They didn't wait. So salvation and spiritual baptism and repentance and water baptism were all jumbled together in the same event, in the same day for them. So they are definitely separate concepts, but they are often times in Scripture inextricably tied together. So the next two questions I want to ask you, when verse 13 says, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, what did that mean for the Jews at that time? And in what ways might this same principle be hard to swallow for, Chris, for Christians today? You see, this concept was very difficult for the Jews in those days because they felt oppressed by the Gentile Roman government. They felt like they weren't winning because they were so oppressed. And so the only area of pride that they had was that they were the chosen people of God and the, the Romans weren't. Admitting that others might be the chosen people of God was a very hard pill to swallow. You see, Jesus not only upset that cultural divide between Jew and Gentile, but he also upset the cultural divide of slaves and free. 
free people would feel as though they were better than slaves. But, but Paul is saying, man, whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we're all on the same playing field. Now, you may have come up with a lot of different answers of why Christians may struggle with this today, but I, I came up with three. I think a lot of people have an air of superiority when it comes to finances. You know, you, we tend to look down on people who aren't making as much as us, and we tend to look up to people who make more than us. But Paul would say, we're all on the same playing field. We all needed the same Holy Spirit. You know, in a lot of churches today, they continue to have a race issue. And I know that that's not a big deal here at the Pulse of Miami Church, but it tends to be a big deal, especially in other areas of, of our country. And finally, when it comes to people who have feelings of homosexuality, Christians oftentimes tend to look down on people who are struggling with those feelings. But I'm going to be honest with you. Paul would say, hey, look, we all needed the same Holy Spirit, the same spiritual baptism. And so the question that I have for you is, do we really believe that we're all equal? Next, I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 15 through 20. And according to these verses, what kind of thinking is detrimental to a believer and to the body of Christ? And what might be some examples of this kind of thinking at our own church? And what is the logic that Paul uses to refute this kind of teaching or this kind of thinking in these passages? What I hope you got out of these passages is that thinking that you are unimportant is detrimental not only to yourself, but to all of us, because you're part of the body of Christ. You know, this idea of, well, I just set up chairs, or I just say hi to people when they come in, or I just do arts and crafts with the children, you know, I'm not one of the most important people. No, that's, that's absolutely not true. There's so many people say, man, I wish I could sing, or I wish I could preach, or I wish I could whatever. At the end of the day, God has uniquely gifted you to serve in our church, and we need you. There are people in our church that are physically incapable of doing anything else but praying for us. And let me tell you something. We need people praying for us. You see, everybody's important. Well, next, I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now verses 21 through 25. According to these verses, what kind of thinking is detrimental to the body of Christ? And who are we supposed to give special treatment to in our church? And why do we give special treatment to these people according to verse 25? See, what I hope you notice is it's not just detrimental to think lower of yourself, but it's also very detrimental to think too highly of yourself. Thinking that we're more important is detrimental to the body of Christ, but it's also detrimental to ourselves. We should give special treatment to the ones who aren't in front of everybody. L let me say that again. We need to give special treatment to the people in our church who aren't in front of everybody. Now, hear me out. I'm not saying stop encouraging me and Steve and the people in front. No, no, we need that encouragement, and, and I appreciate that. But I also think that we should start thanking and recognizing those people who do a lot behind the scenes, the unsung heroes of our church. That way that we all have an equal concern for one another. Next, I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 20, 12, verses 26 through 27, last two verses. How can we give special treatment to people besides just thanking them? And in order to accomplish, verse 26, for everyone in the church, what will we have to do differently? You know, the way that we can invest in people is to hurt when they're hurting. It's to celebrate when they're celebrating. Let's live life together. And that's going to, to require us to get to know other people in our church. 
Sometimes, you know, we're going to have to get our hands dirty. Ultimately, 1 Corinthians 12 is a beautiful picture of what the body of Christ should look like. So my final question to you is this. How does water baptism play a role in our church family? What role does that water baptism play? And last, I want you to close in prayer. And as you close in prayer, if there's anybody in your small group that hasn't been baptized, perhaps this would be a good time to pray with them and for them to consider doing that in the next couple weeks. God bless you guys and have a great rest of the week.